people to move a little forward is, is uh, reasonably empty, or at least in this side center, if, if people want to. We all have back benches. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, okay. They're running the British government right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry for this delay, but this uh, rain, you know, and hopefully we'll continue through the lunch, uh, next two sessions. Uh, but the first one is on energy access, and uh, uh, I'll ask my colleague to give a brief introduction, right? And then, then we'll take it forward. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. For the first session today, we'll be discussing energy access and specifically electricity access in India. The issue has been discussed a lot, so I won't go into the nitty gritties of it. I'm just going to try and uh, explain some of the outcomes we saw in the case studies that we conducted for the SORE. So um, as you know, we're going to look at the state of Uttar Pradesh because uh, at the beginning of Sabhagya, when they discovered four crore unelectrified households, Uttar Pradesh had 1.5 crore unelectrified households. So now Sabhagya has progressed uh, on the eve of uh, New Year's, uh, government declared UP 100% electrified. But we found a few issues that need discussion. The most important of this is the issue of quality of power supply. Uh, apart from the quality of power supply, the situation is worse in rural households than in urban, urban households. Rural households uh, receive power supply, power supply for only 30 to 40% of the time, uh, of the monthly time. Further, the supply interruptions average around 328 hours per month. This is almost, uh, this is over 10 hours a day. Further, um, again, 15 to, they receive electricity on an average for 15 to six, uh, less than 15 to 16 hours a day. Uh, most importantly, what must be noticed is that the supply that they do get is not during the peak hours. The peak hours for the village life is normally dinner time or the evening study time. There is also the issue of voltage fluctuations or low voltage supply which lasts for almost 50.2% of the time. Uh, this has affected a lot of their appliances and it's dire in the case of agricultural uh, pumps. Uh, we must also look at the fact that DISCOMs tend to want to supply uh, urban households over rural households. And this is because rural households associated with the long, long transmission lines lead to AT high ATNC losses. And as you know, rural households, uh, the collection efficiency is much lower. Okay. So under Sabhagya, as I stated, uh, UP claims to have attained 100% electrification. We went to visit a village called, Sh uh, a district called Shamli in northwestern UP, which had attained this 100% electrifi electrification way ahead of time. So it's a relatively rich district, mainly with farmers. Um, so the primary problem here was that the new Sabhagya consumers claimed that uh, they were charged, uh, obviously, they were charged at rural tariffs, but these monthly bills accrued over the years with penalties. So farmers, they have, uh, the cropping patterns are varied across the, are vary across, but they get payments only two or three times a year. So the monthly bills added on with the penalty charges were too huge amount, for, too huge amount for them to pay. There were also instances of uh, seasonal laborers who were away from their household for six to nine months, and they were still charged for the supply received during those months. Um, yes, so the, uh, the affordability of the power supply is something that we must discuss today. So another very fun thing that we noticed was uh, of the households that were electrified, not under Saubhagya, but before, they did not have meters, and the DISCOM, the local DISCOM, PVVNL, had taken up metering for these households. So a lot of these households, uh, so the contractors responsible for this had put up the meters, but none of these meters were actually connected. And so the Saubhagya consumers were, 
the older consumers still pay a fixed tariff for their monthly usage and the sobhagya consumers went as far as to as far as to say that they preferred stealing the electricity because uh, it didn't charge them anything and the power supply was still uh, abysmal whether it was under sobhagya or before sobhagya now discom worries as we all know the discoms are not compensated uh, adequately under sobhagya they're supposed to get anywhere between 1500 to 4000 rupees for every household that is connected but this was not enough the subsidy burden borne by the discom is another issue that we looked at we found uh, somewhere between 3000 to 5000 for the four, uh, for the 2.4 crore households under sobhagya but one must note that this will be borne by just a few discoms and not all state discoms, uh, mainly UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, and Assam. Under uh, subsidy burden and just in a few states, sorry. Another thing we must look at from the angle of discoms is the latest amendment in the Electricity Act that talks about separating carriage and content. Now, this is great for increasing the competition within the discoms, but this will get the larger and richer this could give the option to the larger and richer consumers to move away from the discoms that means discoms will be will have a disproportionately large number of rural subsidized consumers okay uh, then there is the Uday scheme that we have uh, we all know about which is here to fix the uh, financial situation of discoms but not much has improved the acs arr ARR gap continues to rise, the losses continues to rise. In Shamli, for example, the newest electricity distribution division that came in after the introduction of Sobhagya had the highest losses and the lowest collection efficiency. Thank you. In uh, following this, we must discuss mini grids because mini grids, we believe, can help aid the discom supply. They, they assure power supply, but only for a limited time. So they're not merely a stopgap solution, but actually a supporting solution. What we must discuss today, however, are the high costs associated with mini grids and the, uh, ex the lack of exit options, which, have, uh, which mean that, which have led to none of the mini grids adopting the UP policy. Uttar Pradesh was one of the first uh, states to come up with a mini grid policy. So this is something we must look at. Uh, I will hand over the panel discussion to Mr. Navroz Subash, who is the moderator. On our panel, we have Ms. Mohua Mukherjee from the ISA, we have Mr. Rahul Tongia from Brookings, and Mr. Samit, Samir Nair from Gram Murja. Great. Thank you so much, and thanks to CSE for pulling together this great two-day event and for uh, uh, inviting all of us. Uh, I think we all, we had a little bit of a chat before, and we didn't have a chance to chat, Samir, but uh, the, the, we, both the instructions from the organizers as well as the sentiment in the panel is we want to make this as discussion-oriented as possible. Uh, so uh, we are going to perhaps uh, uh, just uh, ask the panelists to keep their remarks to about five minutes each, uh, and then we'll sort of mix it up uh, a little bit. Uh, I think our colleague from CSE has set the context very nicely, so I won't take very long uh, to do that, but I just want to make one or two very quick points. Um, I think there is a, uh, a plus side to the story that we should recognize, uh, that this government, as well as the UPA government, seems to, be at the central level, be committed, at least verbally, to electricity access as a big part of the political agenda. That is a good thing, right? Unfortunately, it's complicated because it's not really only in the hands of the center, it's also in the hands of the states. And the curious thing is that many states don't seem to see the way to winning votes being to provide good quality electricity. So a state like Orissa actually is trying to export electricity even while most of its population remain in the dark. Why is that? There's sort of a political challenge here and something that some colleagues of mine and myself have written about in a, in a, in a book recently. Uh, we heard about how there is a in practice disincentive to provide rural consumers, low paying consumers, because the payment from the, from the, from the, uh, the, the subsidy is not covered uh, in practice by the state government. And that is the core issue. Even if the line gets strung out, what is the incentive of a, of a DISCOM with failing finances like UP to further digger their hole uh, 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 that they're in even deeper? And the last couple of points that I want to flag is it would be nice if we get into a discussion, given the theme of this conference, on how renewable energy could disrupt this cozy arrangement of cross-subsidy and what the impacts of it are, 
and whether and how the, the carriage and content separation talked about in the amendments could also be disruptive. So those are just a couple of context setting remarks. Uh, and I think with that, we will turn to our, our panel. Uh, and I think uh, we're going to start with a few more. Well, let's start with Rahul no. because you are in five I, I, know, I know Rahul needs to leave uh, uh, to catch a plane. Uh, and, and so we, in the discussion, we'll make sure you're front loaded, Rahul. But let's stick to the sequence okay. for now, if that's OK. Sure. Oh. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here. Uh, I had some slides, but I'm not going to use them in the interest of, uh, of time. We'll just keep it to remarks. I um, come with a slightly contrarian position, which is that I think in India, relative to other countries, and I spent uh, a fair bit of time looking at China's rural electrification strategy, and I had some graphs of starting numbers. I think, I, I think it's safe to say that in India, for the reasons that uh, Navroz mentioned about this uh, center-state dual role, uh, public expenditures are just not effectively translated into results, more so than in other similar countries. So from my point of view, if we want to be really serious about giving the uh, electricity access job to a capable party that can carry it out, it should not be driven by the public sector. It can be paid for or uh, part of the cost can be covered by the public sector, but the actual doing of it should be with the private sector. So we are talking public-private partnerships. We've seen this before in the large-scale utility solar. We have all the solar parks are being built by private sector and so on. So I'm arguing for something similar. Uh, Navroz mentioned that we have to look at what can be disruptive. Uh, here I want to just refer back to the work that was done by the World Bank and others on the um, multi-tier energy access framework. When it, when we have to always keep for, at the forefront of our minds that access to electricity infrastructure is not the same as access to energy. We're actually talking about um, available on-demand power that is reliable, affordable, and that you can do something with it. You need appliances. So not having access to appliances is a problem. If you, if you have a pole and a wire, but you can't turn on a fan, uh, assuming that you can afford a fan, uh, that's a problem. So what we are, what I'm personally working on right now um, is a blended finance model of how to make solar-powered electrical appliances. These have only been around since 2016, um, the motor, brushless DC motors that are, and I, I may do just show one of my slides which has a picture of a whole bunch of uh, appliances that can now run on solar, whether, they, whether they're, the electrons are coming from a mini grid or from a solar home system or from a standalone panel doesn't really matter much. The point is that uh, the, the dealers of such appliances cannot get credit, which is why this market is not taking off. Why can't they get credit? Because the lenders, when they approach lenders for working capital, the lenders say, I don't know the technology. If it'll work, if it stops working, then the payments will stop and uh, I won't get my loan back. I really don't like your underlying credit risk. The people you're going to sell this to are off-grid poor people. And uh, I don't know you. You haven't been around for a long time. So the point is that uh, we are trying to de-risk this through a blended finance approach. And what we are trying to do, if you could just come to my pictures of the appliances, please. That's, um, yeah, this one. Um, so if you can uh, actually use the grant money, a sort of three-tier structure and the grant money from a third party to serve as the collateral that neither the developers nor the end user can provide, then you can offer a loan on better terms. And the key point I want to come to is that the end user must be able to pay for the appliance in small installments small affordable installments, and have the actual appliance that he can run, then he has a meaningful access to energy. And this is, this is uh, the key point, and this can only be done um, through the private sector. Now, there's one called Tier 2 Plus, uh, Tier 3 Plus. Yeah, uh, let's not go into this model, but I'm basically saying there are some larger equipments, like the first one is a cold storage warehouse uh, that is run on solar for, for harvest. Uh, the second one is a gr uh, grain mill that is running on solar power in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the, the picture at the lower left is blocks of ice. This is from Kenya. 
So they are basically turning um, local water into blocks of ice for milk chilling, again with solar power and totally off-grid area, and of course uh, street lights. So these are the sorts of things that in our model we are saying that we should give to the private sector to run it, to buy these assets. They need a 12-year loan. They need to run these appliances on a contract basis. Now, whether the contract is funded by an external financing partner or by the government of India is a secondary issue. But we are looking for these types of public-private partnerships where the private sector can come in and deliver meaningful energy access in a way that, is, uh, that they are incentivized to do so. And uh, finally, uh, I, my last one with the umbrella, the risk, so private sector-led or PPP, if you click again, yeah. So the risk, um, there are numerous risks, but what I want to say uh, as my final point is that cooling is the coming challenge. Cooling, we have not, we are not really prepared for cooling buildings, cooling food uh, and, and post-harvest, and cooling medicines and vaccines. And with warming temperatures and everything, this is going to be the biggest energy demander in our next five years horizon. And how we can do this using the, in, the nascent technologies that are running on solar, how we can give a huge boost to those and trigger the market so that these kinds of energy services become available where they're needed is, in my view, uh, one of the huge uh, challenges of what we mean by rural energy access. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Moa. I think we'll have a very nice complimentary set of uh, three presentations from what I know of the, our panelists. So let me now turn to you, uh, if I could, Samir. Yeah, good morning. So uh, as you know, I'm Samir and I work for Gram Urja. We founded this company about 10 years back. <clears throat> and for the last eight years, we've been implementing microgrids in uh, three or four states of the country. So, uh, uh, you know, right when we started this, doing this about you know, in 2012, uh, we decided to focus on those locations, uh, typically tribal hamlets in very remote parts of the country, most of central India, places like uh, Jharkhand, uh, some districts of Maharashtra, some districts of Karnataka, where we implement these microgrids in unelectrified hamlets. Uh, these hamlets are part of larger panchayat villages, which the villages themselves might be electrified, but the hamlets are unelectrified. Typical sizes of these hamlets range from about 25 households to at max 100, 120 households on, on an average about 35 to 40 households. That was the size of these hamlets. Uh, and paradoxically, although that some of these uh, hamlets were in remote locations, in terms of the economic profiles, okay, quite often these remote locations could be somewhat better than some of the electrified villages because they happen to be in very specific, like Karnataka, you know, in the forest areas of uh, North Karnataka. Drawing grid lines was an expensive proposition because uh, Supreme Court rulings kind of made it difficult to draw grid lines. So they were, the regions were unelectrified, but the locations were not necessarily the poorest of the poor. They were people who had a lot of migra migrant income coming from people who worked in Goa, for instance. So aspiration was there, uh, but there was no electricity and there's no, at that point of time, we felt the possibility of grid extension. So we, identi we tried to identify locations which uh, were unelectrified, were unlikely to be electrified, and were kind of better off on the economic. Uh, so that's how we started off. First one was in 2012, uh, and as of now, we have about 70 microgrids functioning across the country. So uh, into about 30, 35 households, which makes it, uh, you know, about uh, 2,000 kind of households which which have electricity. Average size is about seven and a half to eight kilo uh, kilowatt peak per uh, per village. So it's essentially the design is accounting for a usage of one kilowatt hour per household per day, which was kind of the norm that you know we had set in uh, in the new electricity pol policy back in 2005, uh, meeting the development goal. So one kilowatt hour per household per day, uh, and the focus was to try and figure out if there was a possibility to uh, go beyond lighting and basic mobile charging for electricity use, uh, start and you know starting from appliances at the household level, but also things like, you know, flour mills, uh, irrigation pumping, because a lot of these are single 
crop areas where there is access to water, but because of paucity of energy, you can't do the second crop, for instance. So would it, would it be possible to kind of improve the economic profile of the villages by using, so, uh, so in, all, in doing all of this, we always tied up with a local NGO which was working in livelihood related issues in these areas, because as Gram Urja, our focus was providing good quality electricity, uh, not, I know, while the desire was to ensure that, uh, you know, higher payment capacity comes in through economic upliftment, but that obviously was not something which our focus was. We would like that to happen, so we worked with NGOs which kind of felt that, uh, uh, you know, access to electricity was creating a problem in their work. So we worked, and so we've done, uh, uh, like I said, about 65, 70 projects. Uh, about one third of them are in Jharkhand. Uh, about 40, 45 percent are uh, in Maharashtra, and uh, some are in Karnataka. Um, now, in terms of our experience over the last uh, six, six, seven years, I'd li like to share a few points. So, the very first village that we did was in a place called Darewadi, which is in Pune district. And uh, this was done with uh, corporate funding from Bosch, because Bosch at that time, this was pre, uh, pre China coming in. So, Bosch was a very, was very bullish in solar manufacturing, and they thought that. Uh, setting up a plant in, you know, to service the Indian solar market would be good. So they did a pilot, technical pilot. They did three technical pilots, and we were one of their partners. Uh, about three months after they set up the pilot, they decided to wind up their solar business worldwide. But that's a difference to, I mean, solar panel manufacturing business. So Darewadi, interestingly, in the first month, uh, the first month after we implemented that, so it was a 40 household village. The first month had six to seven televisions. Uh, and so I felt that, you know, this is the great, greatest thing that we can do because, you know, you just plot it on a graph and the first month, uh, you know, seven televisions and, you know, they were also aspiring for water and various other things. So I said, great, you know, there is a bunch of villages which really can afford these appliances, but I don't have electricity today. So this is a great, uh, you know, model to do. And guess what? So we are now 60 seven villages, uh, we have probably 25 television sets and all the 67 put together. So, you know, kind of uh, the risk of, you know, taking from one example, anecdote, you know, stretching an anecdote and saying that this is what works in rural India is very dangerous. Uh, on an average, uh, in the first year, the capacity, even at the one kilowatt hour per day kind of, uh, th th you know, uh, very nominal number, capacity utilization in most of our villages does not, in the first year definitely does not exist 25% of capacity, as in they don't even consume uh, 0.25 kilowatt hours uh, per household per day on an average. Obviously, there are street lights, etc., coming in. So, uh, so that inherently makes the economics of it quite challenging, right? Because you set up capacities in a remote location where you cannot think of these fancy concepts of net metering and you know export to the grid and all of those nice things. But uh, you know, you have a battery-based system in a remote location which you need to kind of figure out and to make it. Uh, you know, to make the finances or the economics work is a big challenge because. Predicting capacity utilization, despite whatever surveys you do, despite asking, is the biggest challenge in these kind of locations. Uh, sorry? Oh. <laughs> sorry. Can we not use the phone? Please? No, no, that's fine. That's, that's fine. That's fine. I'll carry on. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so for instance, as a, as an example, you know, a village can, you know, it's a forty household village. Uh, they might have a a wedding in an adjacent village in, during which they migrate for 15 days to the other village and you know you don't you're not signing a PPA with the, with the household right so what do you do with the uh, so when you say average cost of energy and I'm asked this question it is a meaningless question to ask because average based on what denominator in the sense I don't know you know in the sense it it varies depending on how the village behaves so flip side there are you know, players in the microgrid of what, you know, in where they do these projects where you only provide four, four to six hours of lighting, very basic lighting and, uh, uh, you know, mobile charging load. But because you're, you're kind of prefixing the kind of pattern, you know, you can kind of figure out what the demand pattern is going to be. But to, to create infrastructure which can pr provide more than basic lighting, commercial, and, and to predict load patterns, et cetera, is extremely challenging. That's one takeaway. The other thing, yeah, I'll, so just a couple of uh, small examples about the recent experiences with uh, with the grid extension Saubagi, because that's the topic. It's two or three minutes, uh, two or three seconds more on that. Uh, so the thing is, that, again, this, you know, the uh, draft microgrid policy, which is still a draft for the last three years now, clearly mentioned that at the village level, 
we are all for competition. If there is a grid working and if there is a discom also there, it's fine. As long as the villages are willing to pay, it doesn't matter. But uh, on, on a practical level at the villages, there, are, there have been villages which we had electrified in the past, which the, you know, because of this target of doing 100%, so the SEB, the State Electricity Board people came in and said, no, unless you get this removed, we are not going to, so this is in some areas. In some other areas, they don't care. They do both things. So, so again, an example in Karnataka, our grid was functioning for about three or four years reasonably well. The grid got extended. During the grid extension, something happened. Technically, the, their lines crossed our lines, our inverter crashed. Uh, so we, we, we went down. But villagers were happy temporarily because they got their uh, electricity. But then about two or three months later, you know, it was a five kilometer line in, into the forest and some pole fell off somewhere. So their <laughs> grid, uh, you know, so they had good electricity for four years. And then the grid got extended to over four, four kilometers. Uh, some of the poles crashed. And now they did, uh, you know, and then they didn't have electricity for the next four or five months. And then we went and again repaired our inverter. So those kind of, you know, uh, examples of uh, that's, and, uh, Jharkhand is an area where, you know, even if villagers have some places where the grid has been extended, they're very happy to continue with our because the quality of power is very poor. So there's a lot more things that I'd like to say, but yeah, it can. The source of the power, I think. Solar. So sorry, I didn't mention that. These are all solar microgrids. Uh, there's one hybrid solar uh, uh, in Karnataka. We did a Pico Hydro Solar, but the year we installed it, there was no rains in Karnataka. So it eventually became a solar uh, microgrid. Uh, so essentially, yeah, that's it. Great. Thank you very much. So we've had, I think we've had two presentations that, that you sort of make the point very clearly that it's not just providing electricity, but it's also thinking about how people use that electricity and what it does in terms of their uh, economic uh, well-being that, that matters for, for its continuation. Uh, so I think we, I anticipate a slightly different perspective from Rahul, which will complement both of these, and then we can have a discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, Naroz, and thank you, CSE, for bringing us together and also grappling through these problems, which are very key from the human perspective, as opposed to just abstract discom viability in per se. A couple of sort of points, maybe slightly contrarian. Uh, you don't have to agree with everything. Some of these are just to put out there as a thought. Uh, we at this world where we've sort of said, well, the state, the public isn't working, ergo, move away and let the private take over. I'm not saying that's what you've said, Moa, but uh, uh, I mean, there is that sort of need that if this doesn't work. But I want to then come back to the same question at the fundamentals and the economics level, because that's what it all boils down to. If it's viable, if the incentives align of consumer and supplier, then it doesn't really matter whether you're public, private, and full cost or not. So there's, that's where these devil is sort of in the details. The first thing sort of uh, I want to throw out is, if you consume not too much power, it's going to be expensive. It doesn't matter if you're grid, regular grid based. It doesn't matter if you're uh, sort of microgrid, all of this. It is going to be expensive. Fixed costs dominate by far. And in this RE-centric world, it's in fact all fixed costs pretty much. This whole sort of belief that, hey, now we've got cheap RE. Well, rooftop solar or, or village scale solar is going to be not 2.44. It's going to be closer to four and a half at least. And at a house level, it's even higher. But it's still not too expensive. But you need storage. You need management. Storage kills, dominates the sort of PV costs. So that's sort of the first question. So it's going to be relatively expensive, 15-ish or whatever that number may be, 20, the different numbers. So now the question is, do you expect these people to pay it? They can pay it for a small volume. So a typical sort of number of people tell me who, who deploy microgrids is up to 100 rupees a month aggregate bill is sort of the bound that they really see practical. So at 20 rupees a unit, that's five units. At five rupees a unit, that's 20 units. And there's a world of difference between these two. And now the question is, how does this grid really talk about five rupee power? Because they're on a model of cross subsidy. Now the question becomes, who the heck are these guys gonna cross subsidize with? 
And that's really this fundamental question, which leads you to this policy recommendation. We have a paper on microgrids. You're welcome to see more gory details. Is whoever does a, any solution, microgrid, blended, hybrid, traditional, third party, they should get the same level of support that the traditional DISCOM mechanism gets. Because otherwise, it's just going to be really, really expensive. So it's not about subsidy, but also this cross-subsidy world that we need to think about. I'm a big fan of subsidizing CapEx as the one time, but variable costs should be charged. Otherwise, your discoms hate these consumers. Like you gave the example that line went down and they're in stuck. Transformer burns in a rural area, three to five, seven, whatever days is gone. There are cases where villagers have to pay for it, which they shouldn't have to do it. So we need definitely higher quality. One of the sort of things we can get into later is this whole hybrid microgrid issue, because what CSE showed of these cheaper, simpler, but not necessarily the same spec microgrids, there's an issue with that. One is you won't be able to synergize DC and AC microgrids. Second, this is just a personal belief. Why are we sort of saying, let's give you a cheap, but then therefore it's limited in its capabilities sort of a solution because you're preventing aspirational loads, you're preventing growth, you're preventing uh, sort of money earning activities as opposed to just basic lighting which is relatively small in, 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 in load. So this quality issue is, is, is very, very important. Uh, last sort of point, this coming back to this public-private sort of a view. We have a paper some years back that looked at disparity of supply of the traditional grid. So once the wire is there, it's a quality problem now. Rural areas, if they get less supply than urban areas, we calculated this as a subsidy or a social welfare transfer from the rural to the urban. Because it's, you're avoiding procurement of peaking power if you're short of power. Or your so in theory, this should be costed into your ARR and it shouldn't matter. But now by not serving village area A, I've actually lowered the cost of supply on average. How much? Well, the beneficiaries of this lowering, of this extra load shedding, are those who actually get the supply. So when you do the math, which we've done in this paper, where we actually had rural, urban, actual supply data for a state uh, for periods of it. We found that rural areas are subsidizing their urban counterparts, which is, to me, the worst sort of public policy outcome that you can imagine. So until we have these larger conversations, not saying that how do you make them pay, how do you make them pay what they can, but yet give them quality service and let someone somewhere pay, whether it's cross-subsidized, whether it's upfront subsidy, whether it's alternatives, I, I'm agnostic. Great. Uh, thank you very much to all three of you. I think that was, you know, both very complementary to each other and, and really uh, laid out the, the richness of, uh, of the issue. Um, can I just ask the organizers, I know you started late, how long do you want to, would you like this panel to go on until? I'm sorry, the, the one, hour? one hour? Yeah, okay. So, so that makes it around 11.20, 11.25, is that what we're aiming for? 11.30, okay. All right. So let's have a, one round of exchange on the panel and then maybe we'll, we'll open it up. Um, so something that was implicit in, I think what everybody said on this panel, I thought, was that the objective of our rural access and electricity access uh, uh, policies in India has been to get, well, first of all, just wires, but then generously on occasion, electricity down those wires without thinking about what that electricity is used for and whether or not it actually in particular contributes to productive uh, uh, um, work that then over time allows people to actually pay more for it. So Rahul's point that, uh, that you know, thinking about this as an upper limit a household can pay a month, uh, is that actually a hard upper limit or does it depend on whether the electricity can be used for more productive uh, uh, um, avenues? So, so let me just pose this question to any of, you, any of you who want to take it on. Would things change if we thought about electricity not from the point of view of demonstrating that we can get electricity and then get a vote out of it, but actually electricity as an engine of development? And what would it take to make that happen? 
without answering your question, I want to make a split. There's lighting and the basic human needs or minimal, maybe add a fan comfort or some household. Then in productive, you've got the other extreme, which is pump sets. Mm. So irrigation pump sets are such a large load vis-a-vis -vis household that it completely changes every set of calculus and equation. So it's very hard to mix them up, especially on certain sorts of models. So now the only question that I now, without answering it, throw it back to my colleagues, is what are all the other things? And I'm sure Mahua has looked at this in detail. And that's really where I think a lot of work absolutely can be done. Productive loads that are not as demanding as irrigation pump sets, for example. So we're working on four uh, streams, and I think it's, I think we think of even lights, fans, and TVs as only for comfort at our own peril, because uh, if you are running a commercial establishment, suppose a food, a small restaurant or a shop or whatever, um, if you, lighting, fans, even uh, entertainment, television, and uh, cooling is very important there to boost your revenues. Uh, you'll have more customers, more traffic. So we have basically four tracks in the work that I'm doing. We have the inside the house, which is the comfort, as Rahul put it. Then we have productive uses in commercial establishments and shops, uh, any kind of livelihood uh, that can add value. Appliances can add value. The third one is public service delivery in schools and clinics. So you can definitely add value uh, by having fans, TVs, lights, and also vaccine coolers. One of my little pictures was a vaccine cooler box uh, that preserves life-saving medicines. So number three is, the third track is these public service delivery becoming much more effective. And the fourth one is public safety. So you have street lights, you have uh, drinking water points. So there are guys in India now who are struggling along because they can't get funding, but they're demonstrating that you can do reverse osmosis water purification through solar panels. And, uh, and it is not as expensive as you would think. I mean, for an entire village, they're doing it all on a grant of between 35 and 40,000 US dollars. So when you think of the cost of not having that, uh, and you know the morbidity and the health impacts of not having clean drinking water accessible, it's, it's something that you know, people like you would be excellent at doing some <laughs> numbers of what, what would be the, what the return on investment of that $40,000 is. Yeah, may I just ask, is that, you didn't mention small scale industry, agro-processing and so on and so forth. Is that yeah. also part of your? It is part of it because that's why I was showing the pictures of the yeah. um, community. So the, the, the heart of our proposal is that for in-house appliances, we have a certain financing plan, and we need certain upstream, you know, behind the fence type of setups for that. But for community infrastructure, like for these small scale industries, uh, people need equipment that they don't need all the time, and they don't need to invest in it themselves. For example, the cooling of post harvest uh, or milling grains, any value adding That's activity right. that requires energy. We don't expect that unlike a light and a fan, everybody needs their own version of that infrastructure. Right. So this is shared community infrastructure to increase the productivity of all the businesses and establishments. So that was the business model we were saying that uh, you pay in one way for the things that you're going to own th that's inside your premises, and then you pay in a different way for the shared community infrastructure. And we are trying to see how that can add value. And then, of course, you have the schools, which Theoretically, the Ministry of Health and Education should be paying those bills right. for electrifying and upgrading uh, the uh, in infrastructure in those uh, schools and clinics. But and, and then the panchayat should be paying for the public safety. So this was the thing that China got right. They got a whole infrastructure um, approach where they tackled lighting, uh, well, electricity, telecom, water, and roads mm -hmm. all at the same time as part of their national poverty reduction strategy, and they focused on the use of that infrastructure as well. Okay. So this is different in India. Great, thank you. Sammy, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, your, yeah just a small question. point that, uh, you know, I think what I heard you say is that uh, someone needs to think about the, you know, the productive loads that can come up, but that someone necessarily need not be the DISCOM or the, or, or the energy service provider. Like, as a micro example, we work uh, along with NGOs, and the belief is that the NGO 
has done a survey at the villages, has figured out what are the kind of loads that are required and therefore we design our systems accordingly, right? So uh, there's no point pushing uh, a larger uh, solar plant there if the villagers finally don't want. Just as an anecdote that I'd like to share, you know, in 2013 we went to Chhattisgarh and spoke to a professor at a university there who said that, you know, and we were very excited about telling them about solar, this, that, and we'll do this. That. So after one hour discussion, you know, speech from our side, the Professor finally asked, but do you know if the villagers actually want the electricity or not? So, uh, so we had kind of missed that point. You know, it's important to kind of go and survey and figure out what they want. Uh, you know, and to expect the discom or the or the uh, energy service provider to also think about you know what are the commercial. I mean, to kind of get the commercial to catalyze the commercial load is kind of you know difficult. It needs to be some other part of the story. So, in fact, I would love to hear more, maybe even from CSC or anyone who knows. 6,000 out of 22 or 24,000 in the Shamley area that was shown didn't want electricity. Correct, exactly. Now that's a huge number. That's not a sort of fringe. If you look at poverty deciles and sort of NSSO sort of thing, this is not just the edge and the extremely no, marginalized. You're, you're well beyond that level. I so really understand the question that was asked to interpret that. Um, yeah. I just wanted to add to that that in the Shakti Foundation had done a, a survey in Rajasthan uh, for one of the solar appliance developers. The people there who said they didn't want electricity, they didn't want to sign up to a connection for two reasons. One was that it was unreliable, yeah. and secondly, they said they didn't want it because they couldn't afford the appliances. Yeah. There was no mechanism in place that allowed them to pay a small monthly installment. Right to afford an appliance. They had to, it was full capex. You pay for it all up front mm -hmm. and that they couldn't do and that's what we are working on to try and make it possible uh, by giving a loan to the developer. We also don't want the consumer to have to take on additional debt to afford the appliance. So I, I'd like to open it up at this stage. Uh, I want to sort of also acknowledge that at some point Rahul may just gracefully slip away and, and we'll all, uh, you know, thank him in advance in case he needs to do that. Um, I, I want to turn it over to the audience with, with just two quick observations. If we think about this whole, uh, so, so let me just say that uh, uh, some years ago I did some work in Bangladesh and their so-called rural co-op structure basically says, we are first going to look at whether a particular region is likely to have enough productive load, and only if we think yeah. it's going to be cost effective will we even extend the line, right? It's a bit draconian, but that's the approach. The US, almost a century ago, ago did exactly what Mawa said, this basically low cost installment based subsidy of appliances to increase productive load at the time electricity was provided, yeah. right? So we have these models. So rethinking electricity from how, to how we enable productivity and use it as an engine of development as a starting point would help bridge this gap. The other thing I want to pick up is what Rahul said, which is if you look at the true cost of providing uh, uh, rural consumers and what they provide to the grid in terms of flexibility and so on and so forth, and effectively count in the subsidy, then suddenly that economic gap closes from both ends. So there's a closing of the gap from the discom perspective because of the true accounting and a closing of the gap from the user perspective by thinking about productive expenditures. That might be a more useful way to think about uh, about uh, electricity access debates in India. But with that, sort of throw that in a more focused way back to the audience, let's get a round of questions on this. Maybe can I just ask, uh, uh, yeah, can you can you tell us a little bit more in response to uh, uh, Raoul's question about Shamli, but very quickly, please. Yeah. So out of the 10 years we have been discussing these issues so one one issue is that the time has come not to continue discussion but to find something which can actually be done all these problems have been talked about unendingly uh, I wanted to ask Mahua a special question a specific question where are you doing this study are Indian villages involved uh, how are you doing this and how long will it take what is the model what is the process of 
doing this study, who is participating in it, and which villages are are involved, and how long it will take. Okay, great. Let's just gather a couple of questions, if we if we could. Sure, sure. Uh, Daljeet, and then the gentleman back then. Yeah, and very uh, quickly, please. Huh? Yeah, uh, what I've uh, heard and also seen in one or two villages is that actually uh, the villages have a preference for grid connected uh, electricity and I want to ask you whether that's true and if that is true then doesn't it make sense to think of microgrids as a short term measure except in very remote areas and uh, and then maybe what we want to do is make microgrid design them so that they can be connected to the to the grid that they can feed into the grid when the grid actually gets there okay so Satinda Narang. I've uh, seen lights which are standalone lights. They don't need a wire, they don't need something. And some of them are portable in the sense you can charge it in the sun in the day and bring it in the room at night. And the lights which you cannot bring in, why not use mirrors or something to reflect the light into the room? At least they have basic electricity without much maintenance. And I think the other important thing is that there must be sufficiently trained people to manage the look after the equipment okay. because without that a lot of things will be get imported from china or wherever but the screws will not be available or a little fuse will not be available that setup has to be carefully designed thank you okay great uh, let's just take these three and then we'll go in for a second round uh, did just you want to address your question the first one yeah um, i'm very happy to ask the question it's not a study it's it's uh, only for the last two years, these standalone appliances, as the other gentleman was saying, that do not require any wires, have become commercially available. There are at least 16 or 17 companies that are in our stakeholder group in India that are working on uh, finding markets for these, for these products in different states of India. They, we don't tell them how to do their business. These are startup companies that are distributing these standalone products, and we are trying to help them to get funding because we've understood that they cannot grow their business, which is what we want to see, uh, unless they can get a proper type of funding that meets their requirements. Today, they are only selling to people who can pay the full cost up front. So $7,000 or 7,000 rupees for a solar fan, for example. A lot of people cannot pay that. As we all know, in the village, there's a pyramid at the bottom of the pyramid. So the people who are owning the land, who are the rich people in the off-grid area, they are the ones buying it. But we want everybody to be able to buy it. That's why we're doing it. It's not a study. We are designing the funding mechanism in partnership with uh, the European Investment Bank. And uh, we are working on that. I'm not at liberty to get into details because it's not there yet. Hopefully, by the end of this calendar year, it'll actually be available in the form of loans to the distributors of these products. Once they get the loan, then the de-risked loan, then they can offer payment terms to their customers. That's what we want. Then the need for wires and grids and all of that would not be there. Wherever the microgrid, because let's remember, the, the villages are chosen by the microgrid developers. If you happen to be unlucky and in a village where a microgrid is not coming, does that mean you shall never have a fan, never have a TV? At the moment, it means that. But what this revolution in terms of standalone appliances has done is that it no longer needs to mean that. You can still have these things if somebody can make it affordable for you. I'll stop there. I also comment on how you select the villages. Right. So, uh, in response to the question about whether the grid is a, is a preferred mode in the villages, it is actually not a uniform answer. It depends on the state. So we, like I said, we have three states which we do lots of work in, Jharkhand, Maharashtra, and, <clears throat> and Karnataka. So in Jharkhand, it's very clear that the preference is not for the grid. There have been villages in which the grid has tried to come in, and the villagers have said, we don't want the grid, to the extent of you know, how it can get in Jharkhand in terms of you know, they, were you know, they actually said that we don't want it because we know that the quality of supply in adjacent villages is A, very poor in terms of number of hours, B, also in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of governance related issues, billing, can it be, uh, you know, can there be a problem in terms of excessive billing? And so in those kind of states or locations, uh, often the grid is not, a pref not necessarily a preferred mode at all. Uh, so, of course, when the grid does improve, what happens is a different question. But in Maharashtra, yes, we have faced the other problem where, where we have put in grids, but some villages have said that, you know, 
so our model is charge for opex like uh, you know rahul mentioned we charge for opex capex is subsidized charge doesn't it's kept in a uh, account in an escrow account which they use for batteries etc so but the grid is free right for the bpl as in whether it is technically charged or not it, so they then want to have a preference to go the other way around so it's not a uniform answer all around uh, but wherever we do our microgrids they are ready to be integrated with the grid like you mentioned All, so all our microgrids can be used for televisions, can be used for refrigerators. There are there are villages in which people have used uh, floodlights to play volleyball using our microgrids. So it dep I mean, so that's not necessarily representative of all microgrid players in the country. But ours, like I said, is 230 volts, 50 hertz AC with one kilowatt hour per household per day. T pretty much any kind of load, uh, you know conceivable load in those kind of villages it can take care of so that's the mercedes of uh, yeah yeah i mean it's <laughs> so so it's it's because uh, a bank of america or a bosch etc is you know we we are successful enough in trying to convince them that's a good thing to do we are able to do that so, so it's not i mean i don't want to actually call it a negative by saying it's a, a creamy layer sort of a thing it's a fundamental challenge on right sizing a microgrid okay. absolutely because too little you don't have the headroom too much you're paying for it, which then gets to this question of productive. Yeah. If it's not equally distributed, then you run this risk of essentially socializing a cost which is benefiting a few disproportionately. Yeah. It's a very tricky, and the extreme solution is standalone productive solar with its own system, which then is loading all of the cost of that incremental headroom and size to that user. And there's that balancing act. How much are you supposed to spread it around for economic reasons versus social and fairness reasons. Yeah. Let's just maybe yes. get a couple more questions. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Bharat uh, with WRI. Um, so thank you for this, uh, really interesting. Uh, we are um, sort of currently working with, um, um, uh, you know, some of these sub-centers and uh, part of the, you know, National Health Mission and so on. And while it's, you know, it's interesting to see some of the innovations happening at the appliance level, uh, what we are not seeing is, you know, the sort of system itself changing. So 60, 70 percent of, so if you move away from households into healthcare and uh, education and so on, 60, 70 percent of these um, sub-centers and, and um, PHCs, it's as high as that in some of these states, Jharkhand, Assam and so on, are, are unelectrified because, I mean, there, of course, there's potential, I mean, the grid is there, but somebody has to connect it, somebody has to pay for it, and so on and so forth. And um, so here's a situation where, uh, so typically what's been happening is you turn away the patients, or you try and do it in daytime when there is electricity, uh, assuming, or you run it on diesel at, you know, extremely high cost and perhaps contribute then again to the declining health situation. Um, so um, we are at this stage where we are, you know, working with some of these entities, they want to move to look at renewables as an option, but we are stuck at the issue of finance. So the question to Samir, to Mahua is, where is this money? Who has it and how do you get it to the people who want to use this to move towards improving service delivery? And my second, sorry, uh, Navro, just on the point of uh, the unwilling, I think it's also important to recognize the sort of social dynamics, the fact that caste plays a big role in what gets calculated and what doesn't. And sometimes uh, that doesn't necessarily get captured in this time when, you know, big data doesn't necessarily capture that. So, uh, Priya Vrath from Center for Science and Environment. Uh, so I want to take this access uh, questions back to the more broader ones as opposed to just the people who, or the, or the segment which don't have access right now. So the first thing is whether we have reached the limits of our access solution through grid, meaning Sobhagya Uday, or, and possibly even reduction because of what is being proposed in Electricity Act and so on and so forth. And so I, I know it's the fag end, so maybe we don't have enough time to go into that. The second one is, which is probably we can briefly, I think, uh, Navroz, you worked on it, is, is whether the increasing renewable penetration and also the failure of DISCOM could potentially mean more distributed generation, more mini grids as a solution, potentially to increase access and fundamental disruption of the DISCOM because of this increasing distribution generation. That's, that's my question. 
I think this issue of quality of supply is why it's a moving target. Do you want the grid? What are you even willing to pay it depends on what it gives you. So if I have to pay fixed costs for the wire or metering and, the, and I either don't have the appliance because I don't afford it or there's no juice, then why would I want to go down that route? I, I mean, this is something where the governments can do something about it. We've sort of written about this repeatedly that it's not so hard to measure quality of supply if they really wanted to do it. And so once you give it, it's a chicken and egg sort of a thing. Uh, it's not clear how you br break that log jam, but certainly sort of this sort of contract where it says you must pay this if you get quality supply. So one of the things we've sort of recommended now many years back is end unscheduled load shedding for a household. And so Something like that will change the whole dynamic of what access really means. So from wire to sort of service, it, 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 it would move. The second sort of disruption is a much larger conversation. What do renewables do to the business model? The devil's advocate answer is, why would it matter if you're in an ARR cost plus world, where even if the utilities get less money from the paying customers or whatever happens, then as long as they're able to socialize that into their ARR, who cares? I'm not saying that's what happens or should, but that's a devil's advocate view. Yeah. So if I, I just want to come back to Bharat's question. Uh, we, we are sort of daring to hope that uh, these standalone appliances will become disruptive uh, in the way that mobile phones, et cetera, were back in the day. So in about, um, let's say, five, six years from now, if we can trigger this global market for standalone solar appliances, which right now is not getting triggered because the primary customers are seen as not being able to pay for them. So there's this chicken and egg problem. We want to remove that uh, payment constraint and really show that there's like a market of, uh, you know, 1.3 billion without access and 3.1 billion with weak grid. So a total of 4.4 billion people in the world who could go for this kind of stuff. Then there will be a lot more entrants and people will get funded. So that's kind of why we are pushing on this. It, we are going through the bureaucratic processes, as you know, with large donor organizations in trying to get this concept first taken on board and then funded. So that's why I'm giving us till the end of this calendar year. But also with these health uh, centers and so on, the public sector does have to commit to pay its bills for electrifying. Now, maybe you're not going to electrify it with a wire that has uncertain uh, electricity supply. Maybe you're going to electrify it with standalone on-site generation and battery storage and whatever. And that's why I was talking about public-private partnerships. The gentleman who had left had mentioned about needing trained people uh, to run these things. So what we are saying is that you have uh, people inside the house are paying for the things they're going to own, and then you will have qualified contractors with a service level agreement and a results-based financing to actually deliver and keep keep uh, an uptime of all these shared community assets, starting with street lights and uh, the solar milling and the productive uses. Uh, people will have to pay like a two-year financing plan for their in-home appliances, and then they have to pay a little surcharge that goes towards the maintain maintenance. If you no longer want any more appliances, you've paid for whatever you have, then you only pay the surcharge, which is for the shared common appliances. And we would have to say, like for example, if I never have any use for a grain mill, because that's not my business, I don't pay for that part of it. I have a staggered you know, surcharge that we, we do have to get uh, communities paying, and it's completely independent of the grid. It is generating clean energy on site, using it with competent people, as the person had very correctly pointed out, you need trained people who are professionals. We don't run our own electricity supply. We, we take it as we, it's run by professionals. So that's essentially the model. We are in early days, but this is what we have now found some donors who are interested in supporting. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you. We've had a really good discussion. I think we are, we are out of time. Um, I'm sure some of these strands will be picked up in the, in the rest of the day uh, as well. I just want to say that you know we have uh, several interesting ideas out on the table for further discussion. We haven't been able to get to the bottom of all of them and was unrealistic to expect that we would. I think this is just the point is just to raise them. Um, a lot of the discussion has focused in a different place from where it normally focuses in these rural access discussions, right? It is actually focused at the user level. And I think that tells us something, that we actually have had an inadequate discussion about the user level and how to actually uh, uh, get to the stage where uh, where 
productive capacity is raised and electricity actually becomes something that, that becomes a credible service. And I think the key is that it's a credible service and useful because it is credible as well. So if we solve that set of issues, I think that would be uh, a part of it. Um, we also had a conversation about the upstream end, which is where the conversation tends to be, and Rahul made this interesting point about, about, the, about the accounting. We have different business models for how we bring about this change in productivity. We had somebody talking about, uh, about mini-grids, and I think implicit in Rahul's question was a little bit of a challenge as to how scalable that is. Uh, given, given what it would take to provide the level of service quality. We have Mawa's model, which is, if I might use an, uh, uh, you know, a, a metaphor here, is kind of the, uh, uh, you know, in discussions around the Indian state, there's all these hand-wringing about how do we fix the Indian state, and then ev eventually the solution that is proposed is to bypass the state. Yeah. In a sense, this is a bypass solution yes. Yes. Uh, that you are proposing. So there are some who think we need to fix the state, we can't do without it, which means dealing with the messy business of discoms. <coughs> Other people say, that's not going to happen, let's just bypass. And I think that's, those, those are two sort of extremes of, of, of solutions that are, being, uh, that are being proposed. In reality, I'm guessing the discussion is going to pre proceed on parallel tracks uh, around all of those. Uh, we didn't quite get to the disruptive effect of renewable energy. Hopefully that's something that can be picked up. But clearly, re the renewable energy story from the grid side has the, cha has the possibility of completely undercutting the cross-subsidy model around which uh, a lot of rural access uh, issues debates are predicated, uh, fixing, fixing that, that sort of entrenched cross-subsidy story. So I think we have lots of themes to carry forward, and uh, I look forward to the discussion in the rest of the day. Thanks again to all the panels, panelists, Rahul in absentia now, Mahua and Samir. Thank you all very much, and thanks to the organizers.